Shalom from uh, Jerusalem. This is Watchman Talk, a series of conversations with Israeli security and military experts and practitioners. I am Amir Oren, and uh, welcome, uh, Rear Admiral retired Professor Shaul Chorev. It is my pleasure. Um, former uh, Director General of the uh, Israeli Atomic Energy Commission and a veteran submarine missile boat uh, commander. Actually, you're the Israeli Admiral Rikover because uh, you uh, exemplify the uh, convergence of atomic energy and submarines, even though uh, Rikover was only <laughs> the originator of the concept and was not really uh, um, a practitioner he did not uh, practice it uh, as a submarine commander above the rank of uh, captain. Yes, however, the strength of uh, Admiral Rickover was uh, higher than my strengths, and I think that uh, he was superior to the um, uh, chief of uh, staffs, and uh, only President Reagan uh, gave him the sign how to resign from his office. So. I think that that comparison is a little bit exaggerated, and uh, I had the honor to 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 meet him when he visited Israel in the 80s. But uh, yes, and Admiral Rickover was protected by Congress, even though some of his superiors in the Navy and the Department of Defense wanted him out. And in Israel, the Knesset does not seem to invest so much in the uh, maritime domain. And you, uh, Admiral Chorev is now uh, probably the leading proponent of maritime awareness um, in Israel. And uh, it is quite strange that, except for yourself, uh, one can think of only uh, two other uh, former uh, senior officers, um, Admiral Ami Ayalon, who, uh, after his Navy service, was the head of Shabak, the Internal Security Agency, and General Gallant, uh, who uh, left the Navy as a captain and went on uh, to be uh, promoted uh, in the Army. How come um, the Navy and the maritime domain in general are not uh, represented uh, in their um, full uh, capacity in public discourse? That's one of the mysterious things that uh, I am wondering from time to time, because if you are looking at the qualities of the people serving in the Israeli navies. And uh, you try to judge, uh, to promote them into the, let's say, political level. I think that you are right, only Ami and uh, Galan uh, were uh, able to be ministers. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, you are pointing out uh, for a, a phenomena that is uh, strange. Because in the other uh, countries, you can see that uh, people from the Navy is coming up in the ladder, and sometimes they are the uh, chief of staff in the US, in the other navies. Uh, so strange for me. But I think that uh, it doesn't uh, mean that uh, there is no route for other people. Because if you look at uh, Great Britain, the biggest strategist, Corbett, was not a naval guy. He was a lawyer studied the history, and when you're speaking about strategy, I think that he is one of the prominent uh, strategies not coming from uh, a naval academy, naval uh, personnel, or something like this. Not like uh, Mahan in, in the States. Yes, but Mahan in the States, uh, he uh, retired as a, a captain, then rear admiral, and uh, he was lucky to have a good relation with Teddy Roosevelt, and Teddy Roosevelt supported his uh, strategy, and not only his strategy, but also the policy. And then you can see what happened to the US Navy or the transfer of the US Navy from a continental uh, power to a, a maritime power. Charles Chorev, what uh, uh, drew you to the sea uh, as a, a young boy, a teenager in Israel? You already knew that uh, you are going to make the sea and perhaps the Navy, your profession? 
I don't think so. And, uh, you know, there were a, a nautical college in Akko still existing, but not uh, doing the same as it did in the past. And uh, For cadets? For cadets, qualifying for two uh, routes, one in the Israeli Navy and one in the merchant, uh, in merchant ships. And uh, the, the, the selection process was uh, very tight. So when you have such a selection process, it uh, starts to get its prestige. And when I finished my elementary school in uh, Bet Yitzhak, uh, I, uh, I was very eager to go then, even though my teachers tried to influence me not to do such a things. And from the time that I entered the Nautical College till I finished it, I think that I get all the awareness of what does it mean, uh, the, the maritime domain and all such things, and it was uh, trivial to continue in the naval officers' course. It was not uh, the equivalent of Annapolis. It was not uh, a naval academy, but uh, one may say uh, a preparatory uh, school, a high school level, but led by a former Navy chief, uh, uh, Admiral Tankus. Admiral Tankus, yes. Admiral Tankus was uh, the, the director of, uh, of uh, the school, very prominent uh, guy, and he teached at that time astronomy. So he was admired. <clears throat> sorry, by us, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, we were attached to the Israeli Navy because from the second year, we used to sail on board the destroyers and to participate in the Navy, uh, various occasions uh, and uh, activities. So we went through, uh, let's say, secondary school, but it was uh, some kind of, sometimes of college. You can uh, compare it to Annapolis because we study an, uh, astronomy. We celestial study, navigation. Celestial navigation, uh, how to do the sextant. We sail on board the merchant ships. Uh, before I joined the Israeli Navy, I uh, sailed as a cadet on a merchant ship. And uh, so I think that uh, the comparison with Annapoli is quite not similar because Annapoli, they have only one track to the uh, to the U.S. Navy, but uh, the, the, the way that they try to qualify it is... Uh, much similar. Like. But when one looks at the uh, period when you uh, were uh, a student, uh, a midshipman, uh, between the 1948 war and 1967, and even beyond, but let's concentrate on this period, the Israeli Navy was not the senior service, as it is the case in Britain and other maritime countries. It was quite a uh, junior, a poor relation to the Israeli Air Force and Army. So uh, it took some determination on your part to insist on joining the Navy and not the paratroops or, or the Air Force. You are right, but I think that after the Six Day War, there was some kind of a crisis. Uh, and uh, some of my friends left the Israeli Navy, went to the Air Force, became a pilot. So there was some kind of a crisis, even though when we finished the, 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 the naval officers' course, it was at the beginning of the SAR-class boats that were built in Chabot. Missile boats. Missile boats, yes. And uh, I was promised, and uh, part of my colleagues as well, to be a sub-lieutenant in these attractive boats. So we have something that uh, give us some kind of direction, and you are right, uh, before it, in the 56 war, Kadesh war, and 67 war, uh, the Israeli Navy was not so prominent. But I think that Israel is a terrestrial country at that time. Uh, it has uh, very uh, many threats around it. And even though we are quoting Ben-Gurion with some slogans, with his, uh, let's say, uh, when he gave priorities, he gave priority to the Air Force and to the armed forces, uh, I can say yeah. uh, just... When you're referring to a slogan, you used one uh, in uh, one of your publications, uh, whoever controls the sea or no nation which did not control the sea uh, could control uh, its fate. But you say that he didn't put his money where his mouth you're was. You're right. He was good in putting some slogans, but when it comes to the... Uh, doctrine of Israel or the concept of uh, the, 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 the defense or the security concept of Israel, I think that they determine quite right in which area to, to invest. 
let's try to portray Israel um, with its maritime front. Israel, of course, borders, uh, if one starts from the north, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and then Egypt. There was also a slice of the Saudi territory uh, in the Red Sea, which was just across the uh, uh, Red Sea from Elat. Yeah. But then, then the Saudis gave it to the Jordanians and moved a bit uh, Southern. more southward. Yes. But the western uh, coast of Israel um, is actually another front. And in 1948, at least, there was some fear of invasion. There were coastal uh, artillery guns placed, but this never materialized. So we were left with a navy built on three basic branches, uh, destroyers and then missile boats, and then some submarines, which came later, and naval commandos. And torpedo boats. Torpedo boats as before the missile boats, but this was surface. Yes. Surface uh, just like destroyers. What is the, the uh, internal balance between these, all of these uh, components? I think that uh, if you're looking at the history, you are evaluating in what point of uh, time Navy decided to move to the next generation. For instance, I think that the, the, the US Navy, after uh, the First World War, uh, came to a conclusion that uh, the Navy should uh, invest on uh, carriers, aircraft carriers. Not the dreadnoughts, the battleships? Right, right. <clears throat> Which uh, was not the conclusion of the Japanese. And they were right. I think that the, the German, not intensively, but decided to invest on submarine because they know that uh, as a continental country, they can't control the sea, uh, but they could, uh, uh, let's say, uh, destroy all the routes of uh, merchandise to, to Great Britain. Cutting the lines of communication. Communications. So in the First World War, they did it not decisively, in the Second World War, they did it. Uh, there was some kind of conflict between Reder, who was the, 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 the chief of the, of the German Navy, and Dönitz. And only when Dönitz came to be the chief of the German Navy, he decided to go all out for the submarines. So he, later, he later became, for a very short time, Hitler's successor. You are right. So I think that uh, when you are speaking about uh, the, the, the mix you shouldn't uh, uh, speak only about the mix. You should uh, speak what is promising you, the, the, uh, if you are speaking the, the strategic measure of effectiveness, the best one. I think that during the uh, Yom Kippur War, the SAR class boat uh, promised us, the, let's say I, I'm not uh, using the word of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, we control the sea for some times. Sea dominance. So many sea dominance. Uh, we secure the lines of communication. We have uh, a combat with the Egyptian Navy and the Syrian Navy, and I think that we won in this. Uh, uh, and so during the 60s and the 70s, I think it was right. But then you see that the, 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 the arena is full with missiles and rockets and all such things that uh, uh, when you are speaking about the surface boat, the damage to a surface boat, which we saw it in the Hanit uh, case, is not promised. But, but wait, Admiral Horev, uh, Hanit is 20, uh, six, 20, 20, 2006. Okay, 20.06. But let's go back for a moment. We are speaking about the late 60s yes. and uh, a series of problems um, and tragedies suffered by the Israeli Navy. So first of all, even though um, the Navy knew that it was time to move from big and slow destroyers with 200 uh, members so, yeah. of, of, the, uh, of the crew, uh, very vulnerable uh, to uh, smaller and more agile and equipped with electronic warfare missile boats, it did not do it until the Elat was sunk. No, no, it's, it's wrong. I think that the, the decision to move from uh, destroyers, frigates, 
uh, was done by Yochai Binun. Uh, when he got the command of the Israel in 1960. 1960, and against people that late, later, like uh, Admiral Telem, they were devoted to the frigates and destroyers and then things that, uh, like the other world, we have to invest in it. And Yochai Binun, with his vision and uh, with some kind of, let's say, brainstorming, came to the conclusion, and one of our students finished a thesis, research thesis on these issues, that we should move to another boat. Even though he personally came up through the naval commandos? Naval commandos, and he was in the 56th war, commander of one of the destroyers, the Yafo. But he has the vision, and I think that in sometimes you need to have such a, a guy that uh, thinking out of the box, looking what is the tendency, and then decide. And you can't uh, tell uh, people that Yochai Binun was uh, a technological guy with all the innovation, all such things, but I think that uh, he looks far, he has a vision, and then he decided and didn't do it like uh, other, uh, uh, let's say, examples that he forced the Navy. He did a very, uh, let's say, in-depth discussion. But Admiral Horev, uh, uh, this is uh, all true, the idea germinated research and development acquisition. But during the time that the missile boats were being built, the destroyers were still patrolling the Egyptian coast and uh, acting in a way which caused uh, this tragedy. You are right. Uh, but so I think that uh, the, 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 the tragedy is that uh, first you identify what is your problem then you decide what you're going to build. And I think the right way, but then you will have to decide that uh, the former strategy or the former doctrine with the, uh, uh, with the cruisers, or not cruisers, with the destroyers, you will have to change it. You have to change the doctrine because once the Egyptian Navy got missiles and they were the first surface-to-surface -surface missile in the world. Soviet, uh, Komar and Osa. Osa, yes, with the sticks. Then you have to identify this is the threat and how you uh, change the doctrine and the way of operation not to go into such a trap like what happened with the Elat. Now, three months after Elat came the Dakar mystery, the Israeli-British uh, uh, built and uh, one may say second-hand uh, submarine, which disappeared on its maiden voyage uh, from Britain to, to Israel. And that was a very serious blow in itself and coming on the hills of Elat. Uh, it was quite uh, a sad period in the Navy, wasn't it? It was a very sad period. I think that it threatened the future of the submarine flotilla because uh, after the victory in the Yom Kippur War, uh, and uh, before it was the, the, the Dakar, uh, you come to the conclusion that you don't need submarines. So I know that uh, during the GAL project in Britain in the 70s, there was some kind of a proposal to stop this project and to sold it to other Navy because it's not necessary. We came to a missile boat that provided us with uh, uh, all the advantages you need, and why to go to the underwater. Uh, so uh, what was the, the uh, answer, in addition to anti-submarine warfare, if the Syrians and the Egyptians, or perhaps the Soviets, have their own submarines? Was there any other idea um, for use of these submarines? I think that uh, yes, because um, if someone can look further and can see, and uh, in the first days of the Yom Kippur War, I was on the bridge of the Sour class boats and uh, we approached the Syrian coast. And we saw that, that they are starting to, to, to fire with fire control uh, guns on us and it was very close. And they fired missiles. So when you are speaking about how immune you are to such a scenario, you see that you are not so immune. So we will have to search for another domain that you will get all the advantages. To make this long story short, the first time that the submarine were equipped with uh, surf uh, underwater or subsurface uh, missiles, 
it change all the, the environment because they have the weapon with the same range as the missile boats. They can hit targets within such a range and they are immune for all the threats that missile boats have. This, this uh, is uh, probably in theory because Israel has never publicized any uh, such uh, action in anger. Uh, Israel never uh, told anyone that uh, whether it did or did not fire a, a missile from a submarine when it is uh, submerged. You're right, but sometimes you need to have some kind of deterrence. I'm speaking about the conventional deterrence. In, in, if you have the, such a boat that is not visible and you know that it's equipped with uh, such a missile, then uh, anybody who would like to approach Israel or Israeli forces should know that it might be affected or hit by such a, a missile. But once you launch a missile from a submerged submarine, the enemy can discover its location. Uh, it's not so easy. You're right. The launching uh, process is uh, very delicate because you have to to know that uh, nobody, especially when you are firing from the submarine and there is uh, the boost phase, so you can see it, but uh, you're right in this uh, aspect. But the submarine can do it from uh, very, uh, from the depths. And uh, then can uh, go and uh, evade from this area, escape from this area, and this is only a datum. The uh, uh, submarine service is one of uh, the most secret in, in all navies, but in open literature, it is said that there are dual-purpose uh, tubes used for torpedoes as well as for missiles. This is how the Germans built uh, submarines. Is this an accurate uh, description of at least what is in the literature? I don't know. We, what uh, we are telling the, the, the German all the time is that uh, these submarines are for the defense of Israel, and I think that they recognize it, and uh, we have uh, quite a good relation with the German not to come and to put uh, butter on their heads or other things. Now, when you were um, a young lieutenant, uh, going back to the uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, you were a captain of an LST, a landing ship tank. Yes, so, right. um, and you had your own uh, tragedy when the ship uh, docked at Eilat. What happened then? First of all, I, after we finished the head of department course, uh, they offered me to go back to the... A missile boat flotilla, and I uh, asked to have a, a commanded sea in such a rank, and the only place that they can offer me is to go to the Red Sea, to the landing boat, because the blue boats were not there, still were not there. And after a few months of commanding a 36-meter uh, landing craft, uh, they acquired the uh, Bacheva, uh, about a 100 meter uh, a landing boat, and uh, I was nominated to be the commanding officer. The problem was that uh, this landing boat was not qualified to be, uh, let's say, uh, a, a landing boat in the military aspects. Uh, the, the boat was uh, scheduled, was, was designed to take uh, lorries in the Zambezi River and to bring some copper mines uh, for commercial use. For commercial. And uh, the way how to modify it, how to work with the armor uh, uh, branch, because uh, uh, t taking about uh, 18 uh, T-52-5 and 27 BTR. Th these are, these are uh, Soviet-made tanks, yeah. which the Israeli army captured in 1967. Yes, was not a, 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 a trivial process. But what you are speaking about is evacuation from the operation that uh, uh, took place in Shedouan in uh, 1970. Again, this is a small island, uh, Egyptian one, which Israel uh, raided and then took a lot of ammunition back from. Yes, and we, we from Sharm el-Sheikh took, took the ammunition and the logistic and everything and uh, the problem was that uh, they took uh, some mines and they, this uh, 
the, the secure them, also in the helicopter that uh, brought them to the Ophira uh, airfield. Sharm el-Sheikh. Sharm el-Sheikh, yes. And uh, when the, 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 the LCT uh, landed in a lot, one of the trucks uh, with no uh, uh, good uh, driving uh, did it very fast and detonated the mines, which caused uh, uh, the death of 25 people. And I had the trauma of sitting in the court for more than a year, but it's an experience. And I think that uh, such an experience in a career, you need to have such an experience. Na- navies are very cruel towards commanding officers. One reads of many uh, captains and commanders uh, who have lost the confidence of their superiors and are summarily ousted. You're right, but I should say that in this occasion, uh, the chief of the Israeli Navy, uh, the General uh, Admiral Botzer, he gave me the full support. And uh, I think that it was an example how to treat a young officer in the Navy in such a process uh, which you are going to court and you have to do such a things. And uh, I think that it pursued me not to leave the Navy because I was, uh, or I made the decision to go to the university, but uh, I have to, to thank him for the support he gave me. Before we take a break, uh, because we will continue um, our conversation, um, does this branch, the landing craft, have a future with the Israeli Navy? Uh, I think yes, but not in the same, uh, let's say, uh, same characteristic that we are speaking today, because uh, uh, in the past. Because today when you are, and I think that uh, one of the uh, best uh, operation during the first Lebanon war was the landing in north of the hourly of the Sidon. Sido. Okay, so we will continue from this very point in the second part of our conversation. But for now, Admiral Professor Shaul Khaled. 